please take your copy of the scriptures and turn to Acts chapter 1. As you're turning to Acts chapter 1, let me share just two observations about uh, our corporate worship. One, I am so grateful each week for the sheer number of gifted musicians that God has brought to Redeemer. This is not normal for a church our size to have uh, the plethora of gifted musicians that God has supplied this congregation with. Uh, but even, even more than the gratitude I have for how gifted they are musically uh, is that they are uh, brothers and sisters who worship. Um, they are not performing for us. They are leading us in worship by worshiping. Uh, and I'm I am so, so grateful for that. And the other observation is uh, that this is a church that sings well. You participate in corporate worship. And again, that is not normal. Uh, often churches are full of spectators, and that, is, that does not mark Redeemer. Uh, you participate in the worship. I, I love sometimes just looking around and watching you worship. I love watching the kids participate in the worship service. So uh, I just want to draw attention to those evidences of God's grace in this congregation. Let's pray together. <coughs> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the truth that your word exposes to us that is set to music, which we then gather together and sing. Singing your praises and your truth back to you, God. We believe that it honors and glorifies your name to hear your people singing your truth back to you. We want to ascribe to you the glory that is due your name. And one of the ways we do that is through our singing. So, Father, we are grateful for this. <clears throat> but now we open your word, and it is our desire to look into your word, to look intently into your word, and to be transformed by the power of the Spirit and the infallible word of God. So, Holy Spirit, work in us in ways that only you can do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> How would you define a wasted life? Uh, this is a question people everywhere are grappling with. In fact, uh, simply Google the question, what is a wasted life? And you will find links to articles like these. Ten ways you are wasting your life and are just too afraid to admit it. Thirteen signs you're wasting your life. Five signs you are living a wasted life and how to fix it. I thought if you pull those two together, if there are five ways you're wasting your life, you can fix it. Thirteen, there's no hope. Uh, so they don't even offer that. Eight signs you're wasting your life and don't even realize it. So encouraging, all of these. Perhaps the most direct of the titles I found was an article called Immediately Stop Wasting Your Life. And no, that was not written by John Piper. While well, each of these articles I just mentioned offer a strange mix of helpful observations and utter nonsense, outside of God's word, friend, you will not find an authoritative definition of a wasted life. Our text this morning will force us to think deeply about the reality, the heartbreak and devastation of a wasted life life as we encounter a man named Judas. But before we talk about Judas, let's seek to understand the context of verses 12 through 26 of Acts chapter 1. After promising the Holy Spirit, Jesus ascended to heaven. And then scripture offers us a snapshot of what's happening during the 10 days between the ascension and the day of Pentecost. Our text unfolds in three scenes, and as we examine each of these scenes, I'll offer you one corresponding takeaway. 
in scene number one, we find the disciples praying. Look at verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. The disciples obey Jesus returning to Jerusalem to await the coming of the Holy Spirit. But when they arrive in Jerusalem they they meet up with some others for a prayer meeting. The list of names we find in verse 13 includes the 11 remaining apostles. But notice verse 14. In addition to the 11, Luke informs us that several women were present along with Jesus' four brothers. I do want to point out that Luke gives special attention to the significant role of women in both Acts and throughout his gospel account. So it's no surprise that he makes clear mention of the women present at this prayer meeting. Right? It would make sense if we read that the apostles gathered to pray after Jesus left, but there are other names included here. And Luke makes specific mention of some women. The women mentioned in verse 14 are likely those who supported Jesus financially early in his ministry. Scripture records their names in Luke chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, where Scripture says this, Soon afterward he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chaza, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. This prayer gathering may also include the women who followed Jesus and witnessed his death, burial, and the empty tomb. They're mentioned in Luke 23 and 24. And, of course, our text specifically names Jesus' mother, Mary, whom David Peterson reminds us is a key figure in God's redemptive plan and a model of trust and submission to God's will. Brothers and sisters, this is a wonderful reminder to us that God never has and never will limit his redemptive work to a particular group of people. Rather, the makeup of God's kingdom has been, is, and always will be wonderfully diverse. And beyond the diversity of God's kingdom, we are reminded here as well that Jesus valued the selfless ministry of women, something totally counter to the culture in which he lived. He he not only gladly received their ministry, but under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he makes sure that Scripture records their sacrificial service as an example to all of us. Now, friends, what is the primary activity of this gathering of disciples made up of the 11 remaining apostles, these women mentioned, and also Jesus' brothers? What is the primary activity of this gathering? As they deal with the departure of the resurrected Lord And they await the coming of the Spirit. Look at verse 14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. So think about it. Jesus is gone. They are undoubtedly dealing with some measure of confusion and uncertainty. They are clinging to the promise of Jesus. That's why they've returned to Jerusalem. Perhaps they feel alone. But they aren't alone, are they? What did Jesus promise them as he commissioned them at the end of Matthew's gospel? 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I think sometimes we forget about the humanity of the disciples and those who followed Jesus, physically beholding him, walking through the countrysides with him. We forget the confusion that they would have experienced and the loneliness they would have encountered. In in fact, when I read a text like this and I, I read those names, I remember that these are real people. And I remember what they're facing in this moment. And I wonder, can you identify? Can you identify with these disciples? Confused, alone, holding on to the promises of Jesus for dear life? Right? If this is you, Christian friend, what should you do? Well, for starters, I suggest you follow the example of the disciples. Pray. Jesus hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't left you alone. Talk to him. John Calvin comments that verse 14 offers us the two essential elements of true prayer. prayer, Perseverance and unity. They persevered and they were of one mind. They, they were united in purpose and they were persistent. What a wonderful picture of the church gathered for prayer. United in purpose and persistent. This leads us to our first takeaway. And it's this. Prayer. Prayer is the chief exercise of the Christian faith. Prayer is the chief exercise of the Christian faith. As the disciples face a new and uncertain time with new and uncertain challenges, their first resort, their immediate reflex is to pray. This is precisely what we find happening in Acts 2, and we'll see this. After thousands turn to Christ in repentance and faith, among other things, they gather to pray. And yet, this is a missing element in so many of our churches. It makes sense that this group would gather to pray, doesn't it? If we understand anything at all about the nature and character of God, if we understand the depth of our own sin, if we understand the impossibility of the task in front of us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Brothers and sisters, as we consider all of this, it should not drive us to despair, but it should drive us to desperate prayer. The simple act of prayer reveals so much of what we believe. Listen to Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said, Our ultimate position as Christians is tested by the character of our prayer life. It is more important than knowledge and understanding. Do not imagine, he adds, do not imagine that I am detracting from the importance of knowledge. I spend most of my life trying to show the importance of having a knowledge of truth and an understanding of it, that is vitally important. But Lloyd-Jones adds, there is only one thing that is more important, and that is prayer. The ultimate test of my understanding of the scriptural teaching is the amount of time I spend in prayer. If all my knowledge does not lead me to prayer, there is something wrong somewhere. It is meant to do that. The value of 
The knowledge is that it gives me such an understanding of the value of prayer that I devote time to prayer and delight in prayer. If it does not produce these results in my life, there is something wrong. Friends, isn't that true? The more you understand the sovereignty of God, the more you are driven to pray. The more you understand the holiness of God, the more you're driven to pray. The more you understand your own sin and frailty, the more you're driven to pray. The more you understand the enormity of the task in front of us as a local church, the more you're driven to pray. Parents, the more you understand what God has called you to do in the lives of your children, the more you should be driven to pray. Spouses, with every day that goes by and you try to navigate a marriage that involves two sinners, the more this should drive you to pray. Knowledge and understanding drives you to prayer. And this is what we see here. Jesus has departed, and so his disciples gather to pray. Friends, prayer not only reveals what you really believe, but it reveals that you really believe. This leads us to scene number two, beginning in verse 15. Scene two, we find Peter teaching. So first we find the disciples praying. Now we find Peter teaching. Look at verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now, this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. On the heels of one of these prayer meetings of the gathered disciples, I'm sure Peter offers an important Bible lesson. A lesson that sets the stage for the election of Matthias as the replacement for Judas, bringing the number of apostles back to 12. But Peter first explains that Scripture was fulfilled when Judas betrayed Jesus, and then Luke offers an editorial note in verses 18 and 19, giving us the somewhat gruesome details of Judas' death. So if you're in junior high, maybe this is one of your favorite portions of Scripture. Or you teach junior hires, Jason. Might also be yours. I don't know. Now, some have argued that Matthew and Luke are at odds in their description of Judas' death. But I think it's best to harmonize Matthew's account with what we find here in Acts 1. In fact, Tony Merida explains this. He says, Matthew reports the type of death in Matthew 27, verse 5. It was a suicide. Combining the data leads to the conclusion that Judas hanged himself and the rope broke, allowing his body to fall onto rocks that disemboweled him. Now, obviously, the disciples were confused and shocked about the fate of Judas and how that fit into the unfolding plan of God. Now, wouldn't you wonder as well? But this is why Peter cites both Psalm 69, 25, and then Psalm 109.8. Uh, why does he do this? He, he does this to help them make sense of what has happened. Right? Think about it. You've spent three years walking the countryside with Jesus, and there is one among you who has been trusted. 
He seems to believe as you believe, only to find out in the final analysis that he did not believe and he rejected Jesus, betraying him and turning him over to the Roman authorities. You want to know why? Well, why did this happen? How does this all fit together? So Peter cites Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. Now listen to how Tony Morita explains what's happening here. He says, these psalms have in view wicked and treasonous men who are enemies of God's king. Peter took the psalmist's judgment and applied it to Judas, who was wicked and treasonous toward God's ultimate king. And, and in so doing, he, he helps the disciples understand what's going on, how the scriptures fit together, how the story works. But in this, brothers and sisters, Judas provides us with a sobering warning. We'll come back to this before we close, but let me offer you first another takeaway. A takeaway from this second scene, and here it is. Peter's little Bible lesson here serves as a wonderful reminder that God's word is both sufficient and authoritative and has been at the very center of the Christian church since the earliest days. Here's what I mean. The authority and sufficiency of God's word stems from its inspiration. It is breathed out by God. So notice verse 16. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. This text brings to mind two other biblical passages, and all together they remind us of the nature of Scripture's inspiration as well as the method. With Acts 1.16 in mind, consider 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. That's the nature of Scripture's inspiration. Now, the method, 2 Peter 1.21, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Again, don't we see both of these elements present in Acts chapter 1, verse 16? The nature of Scripture's inspiration, the Holy Spirit spoke, the method by the mouth of David. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you, do you trust the Bible? Do you trust the Bible? Do you realize what you're holding in your hands? Are you willing to submit your life to its authority? Do you believe it is sufficient for all matters? of life and godliness. I love how our statement of faith expresses what we believe about the Bible. The New Hampshire Confession, Article 1, states, we believe that the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is a perfect treasure of heavenly instruction, that it has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter, that it reveals the principles by which God will judge us, and therefore is, and shall remain to the end of the world, the true center of Christian union, and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and opinions should be tried. Friends, that article, that statement of faith is something that has been and continues to be under attack. In fact, just this last week, Jason and Dale and I were discussing uh, an exchange that happened on Twitter between Union Seminary in New York, the seminary that I believe Diedrich Bonhoeffer was part of in some form or fashion, and they were laying out their statement of faith where they completely and totally dismiss not only the authority of Scripture, but the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. 
and to read the comments of those affirming that, that talked about the, the time when they embraced the Bible as infallible and inspired and realized that that was narrow. And they turned away from that, rejecting the authority and sufficiency of God's word. But friends, it's, it's not simply about a theological position. We believe the Bible is authoritative and sufficient and that it is supremely beneficial. So for those who are struggling with doubt, desperately in need of wisdom and guidance, for the struggling husband or wife, or the single adult wrestling with a major decision, for the exhausted parent, or the brother or sister battling a besetting sin. Open up. Open up the perfect treasure of heavenly instruction and receive the infinite and loving Wisdom of the triune God. Unlike anything else, the scriptures will cause you to reorient your perspective. It will reintroduce truth, remind you of divine instruction, and lay before you the beauty of your Savior. Friends, do you realize when you're struggling with discouragement and doubt and sin... The devil wants nothing more than to keep you away from your Bible. Go to God's word, open it up, and hear God speak to you through his divine revelation. So in scene one, the disciples are praying. In scene two, Peter is teaching Finally, in scene three, we find Matthias being chosen. Look at verse 21. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. The lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So Luke records for us the process by which Judas was replaced and a 12th apostle is added. The requirements for this new apostle are laid out in verses 20 and 21. And then two men are identified who met the qualifications, Joseph and Matthias. Wisely, after narrowing the field to two candidates, the decision is given over to the Lord, who alone knows the hearts of all. Ultimately, Matthias is chosen to replace Judas. So let me offer you a final takeaway and then develop it a little bit. Our third and final takeaway this morning is this. It is possible to walk with Jesus and to walk away from him. This is to say that it is possible to give the appearance of true belief, but be warned. Verse 24, the Lord knows the hearts of all. My friend John Parrott wrote a very unique devotional book a few years ago. It's called, What Would Judas Do? It offers 31 short meditations on the life of Judas aimed at understanding the nature of true faith by examining the most famous of the faithless. 
in John's book, he points out that Judas knew Jesus. Judas saw Jesus. He felt Jesus. He heard Jesus. He sacrificed for Jesus' name. He knew Jesus' teachings. He worshiped with Jesus. He was with Jesus. He witnessed Jesus' miracles. He laughed with Jesus. He worked for Jesus. He taught, healed, and served in Jesus' name. He was persecuted for Jesus' name. Gave time for Jesus. Fellowship with Jesus. Was around followers of Jesus. Professed Jesus as Lord. Knew the Bible. Prayed in Jesus' name. Looked like a believer. Repented. Supported Jesus. Rebuked others in Jesus' name. Was comfortable, was uncomfortable for Jesus fasted for Jesus, lost friends for Jesus, was in danger for Jesus. But, in the end, his heart was exposed and he loved money more than Jesus, so Judas kissed Jesus. As John writes, he looked one last time into the eyes of the man who could save him and turned him over. Friends, what a haunting verse, verse 25 is. To take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go To his own place. Friends, let Judas serve as a serious warning to you. This is the very definition of a wasted life. But it very well may describe you. You may be going through all the motions and outwardly doing all the right things. You may be walking with Jesus in some sense, as far as we all can see, but in your heart, you've already walked away from him. You may have everyone fooled, but listen again to the words of verse 24. And I say this carefully, but intentionally. May these words haunt you if you're simply playing the game. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all. While Judas offers us all a sobering warning, there is a profound note of hope in this text for every sinner. It's found in a detail that that could be easily overlooked. The story of the one who betrayed Jesus is told by the one who denied him. The story of the one who betrayed Jesus is told by the one who denied him. You see, brothers and sisters, there is hope for every sinner. After Peter denied Jesus three times, Listen to what Luke records. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The look of Jesus which Judas denied and handed over Jesus. Well, the look of Jesus brought Peter to repentance. We know this because in the next chapter of Acts, Peter will plead with the gathered multitude to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. He is declaring what he knew to be true. He is calling for sinners to repent and be forgiven just as he had done. 
If you find yourself this morning relating to Judas, I plead with you. I plead with you, stop the charade. Jesus knows your heart. Jesus knows your heart. Turn to him in repentance and faith, and he will receive you. But if you find yourself this morning knowing that you believe the gospel and trusting in Jesus as Lord, but struggling with your own sin and failure, wondering, wondering if God will ever be able to use you. Oh, friend, look at Peter. The humble will always find grace. And grace forgives and restores God established his church by the power of his spirit, but he did it exclusively through the witness of broken people. And this is how he is continuing to build his church. So, struggling brother or sister, I want you to know that this is the place for you. This is the place for you. And there is a role for you. You can be part of the advancement of the kingdom of God. There are so many songs that we sing that minister to us in our doubt, in our hurt, in our pain. But as I was Writing this, there's one particular song that came to mind, and so I want to close by reading you the words of, of this song. It's the song of an unwasted life. It's the song of an unwasted life. It's an invitation. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come brokenhearted. Let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. O wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt. Lay down your heart. Come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who've strayed. Come sit at the table. Come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary. Rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too far. Lay down your hurt. Lay down your heart. Come as you are. Be restored by the gentle shepherd and be placed on mission with other broken but restored sinners so that together we might glorify God through proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we have experienced personally. Let's pray.